Thank you for that. Um, so we will record this. Um, and if folks aren't able to join us or miss a portion of it, um, they'll be able to take a look at it on the website. So we put um, at least the two past prep workshop recordings on our website, and we'll make sure to send that out to you um, after we're done today. Can you guys use, can all st still see my screen? Okay, good. Um, so we're just going to start out with introductions. Um, we'll do intros of who we are, your um, kind of committee leading the training today. Then we'll hear from you. It's particularly helpful to just spend a little bit of time seeing who's in this virtual room because it may be a great opportunity for you to form study groups if you haven't done that already. See who's taking the exam. Um, it looks like there's a pretty good mix of folks that are planning on taking the exam next month as well as May and then some folks who maybe haven't decided yet. Um, my name is Erin Fosdick, and I'm the Professional Development Officer for the Colorado Chapter of the APA, and I work with a great team of people on the Professional Development Committee, um, and we do a number of things to help folks um, not only earn AICP, but then meet your requirements for continuing education and certification maintenance, which we'll talk a little bit about today. And I'm joined by Morgan and Leslie. If you guys want to introduce yourself, Morgan, do you want to start? Can y'all hear me? I am Morgan Hester. Um, as Erin said, I serve on the professional development committee with her and with Leslie. And I think we've been doing this. Is this maybe like our, I'm going to say 10. Have we done this 10 times together? I think that sounds about right. Um, but I do serve on that committee for the state and also at the national level on the exam committee. So um, I will say I did have to sign an NDA. I cannot tell you what any of the questions are, but if there are things that come up, I can absolutely help, um, you know, questions about which version of the ethics code is on the exam. So i um, happy that y'all are here with us today and I'll turn over to Leslie. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, and I'm also honored to be here with my wonderful um, professional development committee colleagues here, and um, you have some great resources for studying. Um, I am um, part of this committee. I'm also the North Central Area Rep for APA. Um, so if I haven't met you yet and you are in that part of the state, I look forward to hopefully meeting you and we're gonna be working on organizing the next um, conference next year as well. Um, so I'm a little bit rusty. I have not been here for 10 sessions. So I'm mostly here just to help out. And um, as I was telling Aaron earlier, I definitely need to see the answers to the questions sometimes. So this is always a good refresher for me as well. So it's just a good reminder about um, all the things that we need to know and, and learn as planners. So um, welcome everybody. I look forward to the session with you. Great. Um, I should also mention, we all are um, practicing professionals, so we all have our AICP. Um, we serve on the APA board, but we also work, you know, we have day jobs. Unfortunately, being on the APA doesn't pay our bills. So um, I work currently in economic development, but also have a lot of um, experience in long range planning and community engagement. Um, Morgan works in the Springs. Um, I know you just got a new title. So you are... Long range planning division manager. So, and then Leslie, I think you got a new title recently too up in Larimer County. I did. So I'm the community planning infrastructure and resources director. So I stepped into that role from community development director. And so it's broader now and includes our natural resources departments and, and six departments of the county. So I'm drawing from my comprehensive planning background um, where we had to know a little bit about everything. And I just mentioned that because obviously as you go through, it's helpful for you to know um, where our areas of expertise are. And then for some of you that are students, it's always helpful to know professionals in the field too. So um, just wanted to mention that. So I'm just going to um, go down the list of my participants. Um, I think the popcorn style is hard in Zoom and we always, and since we don't all know each other, it's always challenging. So However you show up, which looks alphabetical by first name, just to give you a little indication, starting with Amber, if you could just, um, if you're comfortable coming on camera, do that, um, your name, when you plan to take the exam, and I realize it's 9 a.m. on a Saturday, so if you don't want to come on camera, that's fine too, um, and 
if you're comfortable sharing, if you've taken the exam in the past and want to share that with a group, that's sometimes helpful for folks to, to share that experience of what they're, what they found. Yeah, so I haven't taken the exam yet. My name's Amber. Um, I plan on taking it in the spring of this next year. Um, but currently, um, I am a uh, land use development review planner with Boulder County. Um, and I'm currently a planner one, but I kind of want to start getting familiar with the AICP exam and uh, hopefully get that portion of it out of the way while I gain a little bit more experience. So, Great. Thank you, Amber. Classic. Hello and good morning. My name is Classic Wagner. Um, I previously took the AICP exam twice. The first time I passed it back in 2020. Um, I didn't have my degree. It wasn't a certified AA, um, or maybe it was 2019. I didn't have uh, my certified degree. So I was told that my exam results were nullified and that I'd have to retake it in the future. So I was really overconfident and uh, took the exam this summer and I failed it. Um, <laughs> so excited to take it again here, uh, in a couple weeks, uh, first week in November. Um, I'm currently a planner three for, uh, Douglas County and, um, my aspirations are to get back into being, um, planning manager from, uh, military experience and other work that I've done. So this is kind of just one of those last things to check off. So that way I can be a part of the, part of the group, part of the team. Great, thank you, Classic. Danielle. Hi, good morning. My name is Danielle Cook. Um, I'm, that's okay, it's commonly uh, mispronounced. <laughs> uh, I'm the planning manager for the town of Silverthorne. I've been procrastinating this exam for many, many years. Um, and so it's probably time for me to go ahead and do it. I have never taken it before. Um, I was registered to take it online last fall and then it didn't work out. And unfortunately there were some te technical difficulties and I never got refunded for that one. So um, wasted some money there, <laughs> but looking forward to um, taking it. I'm not sure when potentially next spring. Great. Thanks to know. Uh, Ellie. Hi, I'm Ellie. I'm with I'm a planner too with the city of Louisville. I've been a planner for probably about four and a half, five ish years. And I came from a I just have a bachelor's degree in a planning related field. So figured um, you know, it'd be good to get AICP certification just to kind of get my name out there and show that, hey, I know I know planning stuff. So yeah, I'm taking the exam. Hopefully I registered all right, so I'm taking it next month. Great. Uh, Emily. Hey everyone, uh, my name's Emily. Uh, I am a planner with Design Workshop, which is a design consulting firm in Denver um, for about two years now. And um, I'm planning to take the exam in November. So yeah, hoping I've been studying, but I'm pretty I'm terrible test taker. So I need all the prep I can get. <laughs> well, we'll talk a little bit about some strategies today, so. Perfect. Um, Jeffrey? So Jeffrey Woodruff, uh, Snowmass, Colorado, and I will take it in the spring of 24, uh, currently a licensed architect and uh, looking to add planner uh, to my, I guess, to my list of credentials. Um, and I currently serve on the Planning and Zoning Board in Pitkin County and have for the last six years. So appropriate time to get licensed. And you have a music behind you, so thank you for sharing that with us. <laughs> That's yes, what I was right. thinking too. Best um, view so far. <laughs> the peaks, the elk peaks have gotten snow for the past couple of weeks and sorry to rub it in, but yeah, it's it's stunning up here right now. We'll take a we'll take a little bit of uh, pleasure in your view. So <laughs> likewise, thank you. Come back to Jen. Um, Sorry, I didn't hear you fully. Thank you. Hold on me. I'm mumbling. Um, but uh, I'm Jen. I'm an environmental planner with a consultant, um, and I'm planning to take the exam in the spring. 
Great, thank you, Jen. Jessica. Sorry, I was having a hard time unmuting. Um, I'm Jessica. I'm a planner two in Eagle, Colorado, um, and I'm planning on taking the exam in the spring of 24. Great, thank you, Jessica. John. Hi, I'm John. I'm a senior planner in San Miguel County and um, have been a planner with the county for about seven years and planning on taking the test in November. Great, thank you. Kate. Did you say Kate? Okay, um, you can hear me, right? Okay, uh, I'm Kate Kirk. I am a planner two for Delta County. And um, my background is in uh, land surveying. I worked for the Colorado Department of Transportation for 11 years uh, as a land surveyor. And then uh, when I came up to the Western Slope, I worked in the engineering department for a couple years. And then I transferred over to the planning department. Um, and I have never taken the exam. Um, so I'm not sure when I plan to take it. We're actually in the middle of a land use code update. So uh, time is uh, <laughs> kind of uh, not on my side. So I'm I'm trying to multitask as best as possible, but I, I do want to take the exam. And, and um, so I'm happy to be here and learn whatever I can from this and everybody else. Great. Um, Kim. Morning, everyone. I'm Kim Lambrecht. I'm a senior planner with the town of Windsor. Uh, my background is in architecture. I haven't taken any exam of any sort in many, many, many years. So I'm hoping to, to uh, sort of ease into this process by hearing what everybody has to say today and with the uh, plan of taking the exam in the spring of 24. Sounds great. Uh, Lakeisha. Good morning. My name is Lakeisha Bellamy. Uh, I work for El Paso County as a planner reviewer one. Um, I'm not sure when I'm going to take the exam, but uh, just here to gather some information and hopefully take it soon. Perfect. Uh, Mark. All right. Good morning. I'm Mark Schistler. I'm a transportation engineer with the city of Boulder. And I hope to take the uh, the exam in spring of 2024. Great, thank you, Mark. Uh, Miguel. Great, thank you, Mark. Uh, Miguel. Yeah, um, Miguel Aguilar, senior transportation planner for the town of Erie. Um, I've been planning in the planning field for about five years, transportation field for about ten years. Um, this will <laughs> this will be my third time taking the test uh, next month. And um, yeah, I, I, well, I, I, to add to that too, the first test was the new version that they put out. So um, I don't know if that contributes to that, but then I also don't, didn't know, if I remember right, the first test because it being new, I um, wasn't provided like where I was weak in my um, categories, but then the second test, I was able to discover what were my weakness sections. Third time's the charm, Miguel. Um, we've had lots of folks take the test multiple times and pass, so um, great job sticking with it. Molly? Hi, I'm Molly. I am a researcher with the University of Colorado Denver and an incoming PhD student for the spring. Um, I'm hoping to take the exam in November. Rye? Sorry, I nope, yeah, you got it right. It's Rye Tobin. Um, they then pronounce. And I work uh, as a workplace strategist with Stantec right now here in Denver. And I don't really have a set schedule yet for taking the test. Uh, hopefully soon, but just trying to get the study habits started back up. That's a good strategy. Um, Tamara? Oh, sorry, I was trying to get unmuted. Um, my name is Tamara. Um, I'm with uh, the city of Colorado Springs. I'm a senior planner looking to take the test in the spring. Perfect, thank you. Sorry about my mispronunciation. 
Um, Tim. Hi, I'm Tim Lehrbach. I'm a senior planner with the city of Grand Junction and I will be taking the exam next month. Great, is there anyone that might've joined that we missed that we need to circle back to? If so, just feel free to come off mute, introduce yourself. I think that's everyone. And we may welcome some other folks um, as we go through, which is totally fine. Um, Aaron, it looks like Wesley just popped up. Perfect. No, it's okay. I I, I don't need to be introduced. <laughs> no, uh, my name is Wesley Jeffries. I am a planner one with Boulder County, and I intend to take this exam uh, this coming fall. Great. So Thank next you. one. And hi, I'm Victoria Sanderson. I had to refresh my web page, so that's probably why I, I didn't pop up. But um, I'm a senior environmental analyst at the city and county of Denver. I work in the Department of Public Health and Environment, and I plan to take the exam next month. Great. So it looks like we have a pretty diverse group, both geographically diverse as well as um, expertise and some folks who've taken the exam, others that haven't, some that are taking it next month, others that are taking it a little bit later. So we are happy to share, um, we found it helpful to share contact information so that if you do wanna form a study group, you can. If, if you'd prefer not to share your contact information, just let me know and I'll, I'll take you off. Um, I have this slide on virtual meeting norms. I think it could probably come out now um, that we're you know, all very well versed in virtual meetings. Um, you don't have to use your camera if you don't want to, I, I get that. Um, please mute yourself or we'll mute you if you forget. Um, we like to keep this pretty informal. So feel free to um, use the chat, which I see people are already doing. Um, and I'll include in the, I can send out a spreadsheet that kind of has people grouped by when they're taking the exam. Um, but feel free to use the chat. We'll try to monitor that. Um, speak up, raise your virtual hand, or just come on camera if it seems, you know, there's obviously a lot going on with um, our computers. So if we are missing something, just feel free to jump right in. Uh, we do have a little bit of a big group today, so it might be a tiny bit hard to um, see everything. So just take care of yourself and um, let us know if we need to stop. Um, what we're gonna do today is just do kind of a quick overview. Um, we'll start with you know why you're here, which um, you, you all know why you're here. We'll go through sort of the exam content, what has changed. Um, a few of you referenced that, that, that things have changed a little bit, both with the application process as well as the test itself. Um, we'll spend some time going through some practice questions. Um, I did email everyone a practice exam. It's important to note that these are not actual exam questions as Morgan alluded to in her intro. Um, they are very, very regimented about not giving people actual exam questions. And so many of you that have been studying or starting to study will um, no doubt take practice exams. And I think many people find that useful, even if it's just to sort of give you confidence around test taking. We talked, uh, heard from a few people that maybe there's um, some test anxiety or you're just not, testing's not your strong suit. So I think practice exams can be helpful there, but I do want you to just keep that in mind as we're going through um, the practice questions, which we'll do as a group here in just a second. Um, these are not actual questions. The question format is going to be a little bit different, but it is it is helpful with you know just to have the conversation. So, um, and then we'll end today with resources. And Morgan's going to take us through resources after today's session. Um, we'll send out a link to this recording when it's online, and also a resource sheet, which I've provided to a few of you already. Um, but there are some great resources out there, including resources that other chapters have. So we'll end today with that. Um, and then we will conclude by noon. So um, we kind of like to start with why, why would a planner get their AICP? Um, you've obviously already um, recognized that there's some value, uh, but it is helpful to, 
to kind of talk about this a little bit. It does give us a little bit of distinction among our peers. And in, in this increasingly kind of critical public environment does give us the ability to talk about um, the planning credential, our continuing education requirements and what um, some of those ethical requirements are, which I think is important, particularly when you're working with the public. Um, some of you mentioned the enhanced opportunities. Um, you might have a higher salary ability. You might be able to apply for additional jobs. Some jobs require AICP. In some cases, it's preferred. I'm sure you've all seen that on job applications. Applications. And so it really does give you those enhanced opportunities. Um, we also think that it's really uh, great because it helps you stay informed, right, with those certification maintenance requirements. It helps you stay up to date with those new trends in planning, um, gives you some additional information. And then it's fun to have letters after your name, right? We all, we all want to be able to put the AICP after our name. As we mentioned, there are some changes. Um, I think Miguel, you referenced um, the new exam format. Um, we'll talk about this in just a second, but there's also some changes to um, the process itself. And um, really one of the things that the APA and AICP are very focused on is um, removing barriers to certification and recognition of, of the diverse group of people that make up our planning profession. I mean, we heard that today in our intros, right? There's a number of different um, professions that can come together to be planners. And so APA has really um, been looking at how do we increase diversity? How do we ensure equity in the exam and the, the testing process as well as the application process? And so um, just wanna take a moment to mention that there's some diversity scholarships that are available. Um, if you have issues with accessing the exam or paying for the exam, I know that was mentioned too, that it, it is a cost. Um, reach out to me and I can get you connected with some of the resources there if there's some financial hardship, um, particularly with underrepresented populations. Um, they really continue to work on redesigning the certification process to be more inclusive, reducing some of the subjectivity and bias that may be in the questions. And so um, we do see the questions continue to evolve. Um, and then obviously some of the format in terms of remote exams and trying to make it more accessible itself. So those are some of the changes that, that they continue to look at in terms of making the ASCP more fair. Um, also, there's been some changes to the mandatory credits. I think um, we realized that previously looking at only law and ethics, we were missing, missing some things. So a few years ago, they added an equity requirement as well as a, a targeted topic, which is currently sustainability and resilience that could change probably in the next couple of years. These are important because once you receive your AICP, either in November, May, or sometime beyond that, you'll be required to um, get certi uh, certification maintenance credits, CM credits, and you'll need to make sure that you're getting credits in these areas. And then finally, um, again, some of you have mentioned this. I think Classic, you mentioned that um, there were some challenges with your de degree requirement, and it used to be pretty complicated in terms of what your degree was, what level it was, if it was accredited or not, um, and then what your experience was and when you could sign up to take the exam. They've really simplified all that, so everyone can register at the same time. You can test and pass the exam and become a candidate and then earn your professional and educational experience, so it's, it's a simplified process. Um, and I think hopefully it's going to, again, increase accessibility and reduce confusion. So with the actual exam itself, there have been some changes. Um, and for those of you who may have taken the exam in the past, you, you may or may not notice this, but um, we'll talk in just a second about the composition of the actual exam. But it's important to know that they have been working hard and the group that Morgan mentioned she works with um, have really been adding questions to, to fill some of the gaps that were identified. Um, as they continue to add questions, and, and I believe this is on an ongoing basis, Morgan, correct me if I'm wrong, but they don't immediately start counting pretest questions. So they really test the questions out to make sure that it's not an unfair question. You know, if 90% of test takers are getting it wrong, they might might take a look at that question and sort of try to figure out maybe what's um, what's going on there. So um, you'll have 170 questions on an exam, but only 150 of those will count towards your score. Important to note that 
you won't know what questions those are. So it's, it's not, you know, not something that you should try to identify, but just know that 20 questions of the exam are, um, are really those test questions and won't be counted towards your score. Um, the other changes that have happened with the exam is the areas of emphasis have been rebalanced. And so there's additional categories. Um, there is some crossover and we'll talk about that in just a second. If, if you took the exam a while ago, and I'm not sure that anyone on this call has, um, frankly, I don't know that it's that critical for you, but if you wanna see um, sort of what the old categories of areas of emphasis were with regard to the new ones, they, they do have a crosswalk online that you can take a look at. The new question format is different. Um, so you'll have multiple questions based on one scenario. You won't have seen that in the practice test that I sent you. Um, and I don't know that many of the practice uh, tests out there have this new format, but just know that you will have um, a scenario will be given to you and you'll have multiple questions based on that single scenario. And if anyone has experience with that and wants to jump in that may have taken the exam, happy to, to give you some time to talk through what that looks like. Um, they are developing new passing scores and I'm sorry, this slide's probably a little bit outdated, but they um, started using the data initially from the um, spring exam last year. Um, and that's in order again to test those passing questions. So I'm not sure, and maybe those of you who took the exam in the spring could let us know, um, the past few exams up, up, I think through the spring, you weren't, you didn't get real time results. So previously it would, it would give you an unofficial result at the testing center. Um, but because of the new format, they were not giving you those immediate results. So I don't know if there's anyone that, that took the exam in the spring, if that's changed yet. Anyone that, that took the exam in the spring, if that's changed yet. I did immediately get um, the results. I took it and they, sorry, what was the question? You got to see what. Did immediately get the yeah, did they, did you get the unofficial results? You did get to see what sections you yeah, were weak in. Okay. Well, we can, we can find out about that. Regardless, you will get your um, official results from your test, which is really, you, you need that regardless. The official results, they'll be mailed to you. And I think that's typically five to six weeks. So in terms of the actual exam, um, you'll have, you can see here, um, you'll get scheduled for four hours. You have the tutorial, you'll have three and a half hours for the questions. And that's important to note, um, you know, everyone has different strengths as a test taker. So know your test taking style. Um, you know, and we'll talk a little bit about some test taking strategies toward the end of today. Um, but you have three and a half hours to complete the, the questions. Again, we have 20 um, questions that aren't going to be counted, and then you'll get your official results um, in the mail. So the exam content, um, as you can see, there's several sections, and we'll kind of go through what each of these are. Um, the biggest categories are really research and assessment methods, fundamental planning knowledge, communication and interaction, plan and policy development, and plan implementation. There are smaller and areas of practice. Um, there's smaller sections on administration and management, leadership, as well as um, the code of ethics and professional conduct. And so this is more categories than what we were previously looking at. Um, and they did that again to rebalance and cover some areas that were that they felt were deficient. So we'll kind of go through this. I think one thing that you'll um, note as we go through is there's quite a bit of overlap um, in some of these topical areas. And so as you're thinking about taking the test and thinking about one of those scenarios, there may be a question that asks you questions from multiple categories within one scenario. So being familiar with research and assessment methods. So how do you gather data? How do you conduct research? How do you interpret and evaluate those, um, that data that you're collecting and the sources that you're looking at? Um, this is where you might see some information on uh, methods for spatial uh, analysis, um, thinking about how you conduct community engagement, and then what strategies you might use depending on um, what types of data that you're collecting. Um, fundamental planning knowledge, this is kind of a big catch-all, frankly. This is where some of the, um, I call them the gimme questions, you know, those, those history, um, the historical planning movements, those influencers in our past, um, the foundational legal principles. So some of those 
theory things that you'll, you know, make flashcards on and just sort of know, um, looking at patterns of human settlements, um, where do we get our authority to plan, again, at the federal level, um, some of those definitional areas, um, and some of the crossover between um, other other professions and some of the terms we need to know, the values of planning, um, and then some information on, on technology, um, how it's used to really advance planning. So this is sort of the, the base level fundamental planning knowledge. Um, communication and interactions, another pretty big category. So this is where you're gonna see more information on, again, um, communicating with folks, how do you make sure that your communication is not discriminatory, that it's accessible by all, that it's culturally appropriate. I think this is one of the big categories that has been added um, with the new test. So thinking about social justice, decision-making, um, what specific strategies you might use um, and techniques with engagement and reaching certain audiences, um, how we're evaluating um, our interactions and engagement, and then, how do you navigate sort of some of those political situations and management that you might run into in your profession? Plan and policy development. This is another one of the biggest categories. So this is really thinking about um, as planners, how are we um, supporting policy development and actual plan preparation? Um, you might see some information on state and federal laws here. Again, these are, these are things that might be guineas that you just kind of need to know. And again, some crossover with where does our statutory um, authority come from. Thinking about that plan making and how we are um, creating vision, goals, objectives, policy, policies, and priorities. Thinking about um, equity in the creation of those plans and policy documents. Um, how are we including a variety of stakeholders? Um, looking at evaluation again and really thinking about um, how that's going to inform our plan and policy development. And then, um, you know, I think again, with responding to how are we making sure we're addressing equity and diversity in our profession, thinking about inequalities and addressing those systems that, that may perpetuate um, kind of systematic inequalities in our, our profession. So this is, you'll see some of that here as well. We will make this presentation available. Um, I see that question. Um, and thank you, Morgan, for sharing the um, resource page. Um, so obviously, as planners, we all know plan implementation is huge. So this is a pretty big category. So once we've created the plan, um, and policies, how are we gonna implement them? So this is really what, where you'll see information on um, regulations, programming, funding, um, project assessment, partnerships, how you might address some of those challenges and obstacles that are, you know, frankly, certain to arise with implementation. How do you create an action plan? How do you assign work? Um, and then how do you monitor, evaluate, and then update plans? Um, so that's where you'll see some of questions relating to this. This is a smaller category, um, really kind of about project management, program management, um, thinking about relationship building and kind of navigating some of those external relationships, um, questions on mentoring and accountability. So pretty small category, but um, you know, also important to think about. And for those of you, I think we've, we've got some folks that are in leadership positions um, you know, thinking about how you might apply some of what you know to this section. Um, specifically talking about leadership, again, this is a pretty small category um, along with the one we just previously looked at, but really what's, the, what's leadership's role in supporting um, the creation and implementation of plans, community involvement, thinking about the ethical aspects of being an advocate, you know, what's that line between being um, a planner and a resource to advocating for specific things, um, thinking about problem solving and decision making structures, um, you might see some questions on the ethics of um, DEI. Uh, again, we see coaching and mentoring come up here, obviously professional development is increasingly important um, in our profession as well as others, and then there could be a couple um, items around volunteering. Um, areas of practice, you know, this is really kind of the subject matter. And I think many of you mentioned, um, 
the areas that you work in. And so these are these are just the areas of planning. And this is certainly not an all exhaustive list, but you could see questions relating to comprehensive planning, current planning, um, economic development, equity, uh, facility planning, food systems, hazard mitigation, health, obviously housing is a huge one, historic and cultural resources, infrastructure, natural resources, um, recreation, regional planning, rural or small town planning, um, urban design, as well as transportation, mobility, and access. So you could you could expect um, questions that are kind of specific to a certain subject matter or area of practice. And then last, but certainly not least, is the AICP Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct. Um, obviously, as planners, any planner, um, you know, there is a code of conduct for us. And we, we in our profession know we have a responsibility to the public, to our clients or employers, as well as to our profession as a whole. And so when you receive your AICP, you will need to uphold um, the code of ethics and rules of conduct. And, um, you know, one of those requirements is to get your continuing ed credits. And we're here to help you with that. Um, in terms of studying for the exam, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this as we go through, is there's multiple versions of the Code of Ethics. Um, and Morgan, jump in here if I get this wrong. It's our understanding that they have moved to the current code. Um, and why that's important is because there's now language specifically regarding um, discrimination and harassment, whereas previously that was a bit of a gap in the code. Um, so, you know, these, these could be questions where you would have a scenario and you would be asked, you know, what is the, what is the way that a planner should behave? Um, there is a good book, um, Ethics for Practicing Planners. It's a little bit older and I don't know if it's um, completely up to date with our code, but that's a good resource to take a look at. And then just reading through, um, you know, some of these scenarios and how you might apply the code um, and rules of conduct. So if, if it were me, I would probably print these out. I would just read through them, become familiar with them, and then think about, you know, what are some of the um, scenarios in which a planner might be put in and how would you apply the, um, the code and rules of conduct? Morgan, do you have anything you wanna add? Just that the, the code that will be on the exam is the 2022. There are several iterations of the code of ethics and that is the most updated and most recent and everything else you said made complete sense and was perfect. So we'll make sure to update our resource list um, with the most current code because that is a change. So again, I don't think this is something that's gonna be completely, you know, change the way you study. Um, it's more additions, you know, something that, was ethical in 2016 is still ethical today. It's more additive. So just know that if you've previously taken the exam that there could be some questions with the new code and you, you probably wanna familiarize yourself with that. Um, so with that, we are going to move into our practice test review. Um, if you didn't get a chance to complete this, it's not, not really a big deal. We're just gonna go through this together as a group. Um, you know, we do have a fairly high number of people here today. Um, we'll try to do our best to kind of rotate, but you know, you can feel free to put your answer in the chat. You can just come off mute and say your answer. You can raise your hand. We'll kind of see what works. Um, each group is a little bit different. Um, so if you've had a chance to complete this practice test, pull it out. Um, this has 48 questions and really it's sort of uh, designed to mimic the amount of time that you'll have per question on the actual exam. But again, know that these are not, nor are any of the practice tests you take, really going to contain actual exam questions. They are, um, the exam committee is pretty protective of that. As Morgan mentioned, she had to sign an NDA. Um, she's not going to tell us all questions. So um, just know that um, these aren't going to be actual questions, but there may be some that are, are similar. There will be questions that are quite a bit different in terms of those scenarios that have multiple questions associated with them. So we're just going to rotate through this. Um, this is the time when I try not to get um, sidetracked because I have two screens going so that I'm not sharing the answers with you ahead of time. Um, 
but we're just going to kind of rotate through. I'll take a question. Morgan will take a question. Leslie will take a question. We'll try not to get confused. Um, some of these questions are easy and it's like, who wrote this book? That won't take long. Some of them we want to have some conversation of. So if you got a different answer and you want to know why, um, don't feel bashful about asking that. I always like to tell the story that the very first workshop I did, I got like that I was hosting as the PDO, I got the first question wrong. And it was like, we had to have a 10 minute conversation about, um, you know, why the answer was what it was. So it's just really a, an opportunity for us to learn together and for us to discuss how you might approach test taking and the questions. Um, so the first question that's on our, um, um, sorry, I'm, I'm getting distracted by the chat. I'm gonna look at the screen. Um, that's on our exam is which type of zoning allows a mixture of uses and promotes flexibility in design and density. Does anyone wanna take a shot at that? Okay, Kate has PUD, Emily thinks PUD. So this is a, this is sort of one of those interesting questions. Um, and Ellie, you're right. It's actually overlay zones. Um, and I think the key here and others jump in. Um, so PUDs certainly do allow flexibility um, in design and density um, and, and, and can allow a mixture of uses. But I think the key here is which type of zoning. You know, in many communities, PUDs can be a zoning district. Um, but really they're more of a development process oftentimes. So I think um, it's important not to be too specific around if you work in a local jurisdiction or work with clients um, in a specific area, really think about how could you generalize this? So this question is really asking about the type of zoning. So those of you that got overlay zones are correct. Overlay zones can allow a mixture of uses and promote more flexibility than what a base zone can. Any questions on that? Or this is always one that um, we spend some time kind of debating, so. What is pyramid zoning and where's that used? You know, I think pyramid zone may refer to um, historic zoning that if you, every, zone that's more intense includes those zones that are less intense. So if you start with, you know, an ag zone and then have your residential zones, any uses that are allowed in those higher zones, you know, if you think about a pyramid, um, are allowed in the more intensive zones beneath it. And I don't, I think that's frankly a pretty antiquated way of zoning. Um, so I wouldn't see that being used a lot. Okay, Morgan. Okay, so as Aaron said, there's gonna be some questions that require having to go through the analysis and others that are memorization. And this is definitely an example of that. Who authored the image of the city? And I see that there are some responses already. It is in fact B. Um, Probably no discussion on that. These are some of those gimmies. Um, and I'll go over this later in our session today. But whenever you're studying, being mindful of the things that you know and focus on what you don't know. If you have something that is straight up memorization, memorize it, move on to the other things that you need to put more time into. Um, I don't really have anything else to say about this. So great job, everybody. It's B. The other thing that I would add, I'll talk a little bit about some of the test taking strategies. Um, if you're not sure, you can mark a question and come back to it. Um, and there could be other questions that may help you. You know, this might not be the best example, but there could be other questions that could help you answer a question. So if there was a question later that referenced Kevin Lynch and the image of the city, that might, um, I don't know that you would be so lucky as to have something that specific. But just know that, you know, if you're like, I don't really remember which which author that was, you could always mark it and come back. Okay, uh, next question, Leslie. All right, uh, so which employee focused TDM strategies are commonly used 
specifically for commute trip reduction? And this is a layered question, so take a little time. It looks like most folks are saying D. And we do have some transportation planners on the, the session here, so you may be able to respond to this better than I can even. So D is the correct answer. Um, D being end of trip facilities and transit fare subsidies. Um, we don't need to belabor this. Does anyone have questions? Okay. We'll just kind of go through unless there's specific questions. I think the key here is again, you can use process of elimination. You're really looking at TDM, employee focused TDM strategies, which can help you get to the right answer here. There is a question there about what's an end of trip facility. So that could be like showers. Um, that could be, um, you know, potentially maybe a, I mean, that's, that's the most common one I would think of. I don't know if there's any transportation planners that would folk that would have things to add. Um, it could be bike lockers. Um, it could be, you know, something that's going to be at the end of an employer's trip. Yeah. So, um, thank you, Kate. So those are facilities that, um, are in businesses for people that ride bikes, walk, work out. Yeah. So showers, lockers, bike lockers, um, you know, scooters, you know, something that is going to help an employee. Okay, here's a question. We're doing math um, before 10 a.m. on a Saturday. <laughs> what is the floor area ratio of this four-story building shown in the graphic here? And before we get to the answer, I have a question for those who recently took the exam. Were you allowed paper to jot notes down? because I've heard from some that they were not able to take notes during their exam. During the digital, I was able to take notes. Um, they didn't, I had a piece of paper. They just made sure that they ripped it up at the end. Okay, excellent. Um, Cause I wanted, I didn't want to say something and then the, you don't get to use paper. Um, this is an example of something that even if you're like, yeah, I totally got this. Maybe sketch yourself a little picture during the exam. Okay, Miguel confirmed he was also a lot of paper. And then Ellie has shared a resource in the chat around how to visualize FAR. So we've got a lot of folks saying B, which is the correct answer. The FAR of this building is one. Um, does anyone have questions on this? This is a, a relatively easy example. Looks like we're pretty solid on this. If you've got questions about FAR, um, check out this um, vis visualization um, that Ellie shared in the chat. What is FAR.org? Okay, next question. Morgan. Another example of memorization, which book did the father of regional planning write? So first the question is, who is the father of regional planning? Yes, Emily. So it looks like the majority of the responses are correct. It is A, cities and evolution. All right. And that was Patrick Gettys. Okay, Leslie. All right. So what can be described as a budget that reflects one-time major expenditures to be used over a long period of time? I'm seeing mostly B as the answer, which is correct. Does anybody have any questions about that one? All right. So I think the key here, if you aren't familiar with capital budgets, is it's different than an operating budget because we're really looking at 
one-time major expenditures over a long period of time versus an operating budget that would be potentially a year, right? Okay. A strategic plan involves which of the following? So again, taking a look at the options and I don't know why the, I don't, I don't know why the um, <laughs> letters are like that. So sorry. We always forget about that one. I know, every time we talk about this and then we forget to update it, but that's okay. <laughs> So it's a little hard for me with the responses. Um, I believe the correct answer um, here is all of the above. So a st strategic plan um, can focus on a limited issue, problem or project. It is um, an open process. It can use a SWOT and can identify resources. Um, Anyone have questions? It seems like most folks that responded, if I'm reading the responses correctly, did not think that a strategic plan would focus on a limited issue project or problem. I have some thoughts on that, but anyone that answered um, D want to talk about why you didn't think that a strategic plan would focus on a more limited issue problem or project or geography even? If you don't, um, that's fine. My my thought on this is you could have a strategic plan that was specific to a specific, uh, no, sorry, that was specific to, um, you know, one corridor or one topic in your community, um, one specific project that you were looking at. You, you could have a strategic plan that was more limited in focus, um, which is why I think that this is all of the above. Okay. A number eight of variance can be described as what? And something to be mindful of, there are going to be some questions that um, it's best that you not personalize the question or responses as to the specific, for those who are municipal planners, for the processes that you do within your specific jurisdiction. Um, but there are some, and I know that this is one of those things that, why are you even saying this? It makes, it's pointless to say, but just be mindful of it because there are some situations where you can personalize it. There are going to be some terms that are very similar to one another, um, but just being aware of that. And if you are feeling confident with your planning vocabulary words, then it might not be something that you even need to worry about. So um with this, a variance, I saw some of the responses that came in, is um, something that is a form of relief from requirements of an ordinance based upon unnecessary hardships. So that is A, um, situations where the property owner cannot perform whatever type of development, um, there's, there's a hardship that they cannot control um, and they need to submit some sort of request where they can deviate from the regulations and that would be a variance. So are there any questions on this one? And I think this is one of those where it's sort of easy to say, every jurisdiction can do things differently. So you can almost immediately eliminate C and D. Um, and B, when you really look at it, um, a variance is relief from a hardship, but it's not the hardship itself. And so this one is one where even if you're not sure um, what a variance is, you probably will be because you'll have researched that for your law cases and sort of the four part variance test, but um, you can easily get to the, this through process of elimination. 
And to Aaron and Morgan's point too, um, requirements between cities and counties vary a bit too. There are statutory requirements for counties. And so you may see things that are more generalized that way. And this is a national exam too. So it varies state by state. Um, so yep, go ahead. Okay, so this question, of the following growth management techniques, which would likely be used to reduce development density? seeing a smattering of answers here, mostly around C. Does anybody want to say something about this question? I'm not sure if this was the correct logic for it, but when I was going through it, I looked at the term density and it seemed like A, B, and D would help temporarily but it results in like build out whereas c is a bit more related to density itself because it's the size of the lots but yeah that was how that was what i used mm -hmm. for that one yeah great that's great thinking around that yeah i think that's exactly right ellie i mean the building per i know someone had put building permit caps and that's absolutely a growth management technique um, but it ultimately wouldn't reduce development density uh, unless combined with something else but in and of itself um, your your logic was correct that large lot zoning is really the type of technique that would um, impact density the most. Okay, so um, for which of the following demographic groups is a male survey instrument most effective? So it looks like folks are thinking um, A, senior citizens. We have a few people saying C or B. So I think this is uh, an interesting question. Um, we've talked a little bit too about specific census questions and how those will show up on the exam. Um, the things that I key into here, the, the correct answer is A, senior citizens, um, older adults. Um, and I think what I take away, obviously we, we probably all do a lot of engagement um, in our work. Male surveys can be extremely effective for many groups, but when we're thinking about the, um, you know, potentially a male survey as compared to a digital survey or, um, you know, something online, I think really what we're looking at is older adults may not use technology in the same way that um, the other groups listed here might. Um, that's been shown to, you know, similar to when might you use a newspaper ad if you're trying to reach a certain demographic group that older adults, um, you know, may tend to respond more favorably to the male. So, um, you know, apartment dwellers is an interesting one because as a practicing planner, I think um, you uh, oftentimes may want to reach apartment dwellers through a mail survey. Um, that could be challenging because if you're using um, property ownership versus, you know, address data itself, you might end up reaching um, the property owner versus the, the renter. But the question, the response that they're looking for here is senior citizens, again, thinking about um, the digital divide and which groups may be responding um, to mail surveys more. Anyone wanna talk about that, challenge that? Okay. Okay, so multiple options here. Green infrastructure is what? So what should be cost effective, should be integrated with gray infrastructure, should incorporate multifunctionality, and can be used to lessen heat island effects. And it looks like 
I love that, you know, sending out the exam early, it looks like everybody was able to take advantage of that time. Um, or everybody is speed reading, uh, but the correct answer here is C. So it's all of these options. Green infrastructure being something that helps with the management of stormwater. Um, so, you know, wanting these measures to be in place with development, obviously it should be cost effective, not wanting it to be something that's gonna put a financial burden on the developer um, because we wanna see these practices in development um, can be integrated with great infrastructure. Um, and so that great infrastructure is can be something like the pipes, pumps, ditches, detention ponds, um, also for the management of stormwater and should be multifunctional um, as well as lessening heat island effects. So that's a huge focus that where I work that we've been focusing on um, wanting to minimize the amount of pavement and developments and incorporating green infrastructure. So are there any questions for this one before we move on? All right. In which case did the Supreme Court say that the, the community may prohibit unrelated individuals from living as a family in the same house? Everybody's jumping in pretty quickly. As Morgan said, he had a chance to do your homework. I think I've seen all B answers so far, which is correct. Does anyone feel comfortable talking about um, what this case, kind of what the importance of this case? I mean, obviously the, the question is there. Any questions on any of the other ones or um, anyone want to say anything about this case? And no, Emily, I wouldn't think that they would, there's potentially questions on um, specific, I think we'll see one later in the test about specific housing acts and what, who did, when did things happen. But I don't think there would be a question like, uh, did the Supreme Court in the case of Village of Belterre, was it in 1974, 75 or 76? Like, I don't think that there's the, that type of question. And Aaron, you were saying what I was typing. So love that we're sharing a brain today. <laughs> um, we it's do helpful to know roughly when these um, court cases were decided or when specific things happened in time. Um, but as far as the specific year, probably not more like the decade or generally when it happened. Or potentially relationship to other cases. Uh, yeah. And in terms of, is there, we will share some resources. I know for me, when I took the exam and it's not complete because I took the exam many years ago, but I did do a list of all the cases that would be important. And I think there's, you know, probably flashcards out there that you can, you can get that are really kind of the main cases. So we'll share it, Raya, I see your question and we'll share that with you in our resource sheet. A, a timeline with the chronology of when these major decisions happened could be really helpful too. So in this in this question, you know, even if you're not sure, um, you might know that the Moore versus Cleveland was a, a case around zoning um, that prohibited a uh, grandparent, um, and that was deemed unconstitutional. So it didn't really. That was a case of related individuals. Um, the TVA versus Hill was really more around the Endangered Species Act, um, and then April versus Broken Arrow was. Um, really around a taking. And so even if you're not sure, you can you can kind of potentially eliminate if you know what some of these other cases are. So that's another good good example of, of when you can use process of elimination. Um, 2010 census revealed which of the following. So this, here's a, another time when um, we're kind of getting into census. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend time trying to memorize, you know, overall demographic percentages, you know, looking at age, I mean, they might have something of generally what's the trend of population growth in the US, um, but they're not going to have something of, you know, what's the population of Tennessee in 1950, 
Um, you don't need to know that type of information. It's more trends. Morgan, do you know if they have incorporated 2020? I don't believe they have yet because all of the results have not been, you know, they're still releasing that. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. And it's not something that has come up. Um, yeah. But like you just said, I my recommendation is to go to the census website and they do have resources on there that describe the trends that Erin was just sharing. You know, where's in-migration coming from? Where are most people moving? Um, you know, focusing on California and Texas residents moving elsewhere or businesses moving into Texas to benefit from the income, you know, those types of things. It's not going to be, like you said, the population of Tennessee or, um, you know, what was the change in Nebraska between these 10 year increments? It's, it's more of the general and it's things that as planners, I would say we we're very familiar with it. So it's not going to be those minute details where you're going to see it and think, oh my God, I have no idea what this means. So Emily, to your question, will the 2010 census um, questions show up? I think if they do, um, previously we've been told that there's not specific information again, because all of the, you know, it takes so long to process that data and then to develop the question. So if there were questions, I think it could be a question like this, the 2020 census revealed which of the following, and, and frankly, it's probably the same things that the um, 2010 census revealed. So the, the correct answer here is that we are increasingly a diverse population, which I think is true. We're seeing that again in 2020. Um, you know, if you wanna look at this question, the, the decennial census doesn't ask questions around income. So, you can immediately eliminate C and D, right? There's no, there's no income questions on the decennial census. Um, the migration question, um, you know, we are becoming increasingly diverse. I think um, in 2010, I don't know that we saw a slowing of migration into the U.S. That could be potentially arguable in 2020. But um, again, I think these these are going to be general. So I think, as Morgan mentioned, just knowing general trends. You know, we're aging as a population. We're becoming increasingly diverse. Our household sizes are generally decreasing. Um, you know, we are seeing migration patterns to Morgan's point. You know, the, the South continues to, to grow in population. Those types of things are really what you'd want to focus on. Okay. Hey, um, in drafting a neighborhood plan, what is the most efficient and effective way to ensure that the interest of all groups has been addressed? Watching all the responses coming in. And it looks like the majority are for B, which is the correct response, conducting focus group meetings in the neighborhood to discuss plan concepts and issues prior to drafting the plan. Um, with this, not, not much dialogue from my end, but putting yourself in the, in the position of being both the planner as well as the participant that what would make a neighborhood plan specific to a defined area most successful. Um, you know, obviously if the plan is for them, how do you get the input from them before putting a draft together? And I did see someone mention C and I think um, this isn't to say that you also might not conduct opinion polls to determine issues and desires and potentially you could start with that. I think the key here is that if we're wanting to make sure that we are addressing the interests of all groups, we may not get to some of that if it was a, a poll. Um, you know, there could be specific, you know, maybe a specific advocacy group or a specific um, neighborhood group that formed and a, a poll might not get that. Um, and so I think really that those focus group meetings are, are probably a more effective tool. Not again, not that you wouldn't also do opinion polls, but just kind of that nuance there. So a great example of, for those who have taken several practice tests and quizzes, you have surely gathered 
um, there are some questions that have been phrased as to determine what the best correct answer is. Here's an example of that. Okay, so a planner's primary obligation is which of these? And it looks like everybody is answering C, which is great. And that is to serve the public interest. And again, that doesn't mean that some of these others don't apply, but that's the, the, the basic correct answer to begin with. So question 16, the intensity of a residential land use is typically measured by what? So it looks like a lot of folks say C, dwelling units per acre, which is correct. Um, we've had discussion about this one in the past, and it is possible to measure um, using FAR, although that is typically more associated with commercial or mixed-use buildings. Um, you don't typically use FAR um, for residential land use. Um, so there could be codes that have FAR requirements for um, buildings, particularly if you're using more of a form-based code, but generally um, residential uses are, are measured uh, using DUs per acre. So again, thinking as Morgan was mentioned, um, typically measured. So what's the kind of most common way? And, and as Aaron, Aaron mentioned, going back and forth, like that you can mark a question if you're not so sure. So there was a previous question about how to manage um, the intensity of development through large lot development. These, I would not say that these two questions go hand in hand, but they are somewhat related. So if that was maybe a question that tripped you up and you marked it, and then you got to this one and thought, oh, that's kind of a similar situation. Then you could go back to that answer, respond, seeing that these two are somewhat related. Okay, 17, which of the following best describes the composition of the block highlighted below? So this does call for um, the colors, knowing what they all stand for. So quick question, are the, all these, um, I guess just like visually, are all these blocks the same lot size? Yes, you would assume okay. that they are. Okay, just check in. Yeah, um, I would say, Emily, that with these types of questions, you know, that they have some of the responses that are down to the decimal point. Um, this is not so much an exam focusing on how skilled you are in math. <laughs> I mean, we all, we need to know um, the basics, but this is not something that's going to intentionally trip you up and, you know, something is slightly off from um, another with these lot sizes. So more of a general. All right, thanks. Yeah. And watching the responses come in, uh, the correct answer is C. So about half of this is residential, 30% park and 20 retail. And being mindful of Red is typically going to be representative of commercial uses. Uh, green is for park or open space and some sort of gradient from yellow to brown is representative of residential. So um, the darker the color gets, the more intense um, that residential use would be. And I saw a question pop up. Okay. okay, yeah, the size. Yeah, I think the, the key here is sort of relative size, um, you know, and I think as Morgan said, you can kind of immediately eliminate B because to your point, 
you don't know the lot sizes. And so there's not that level of specificity of figuring out actual land area, right? Um, I think you can also pretty much eliminate D because you can say, it, you know, the, the percentages are just off. Um, for me, the key in looking at this, and again, this is um, a little bit nuanced, but you t I've never really seen um, land use or zoning that would show multifamily residential as yellow. Certainly residential is yellow, but I think you would expect to see kind of darker um, and, and there's a little bit of a size difference between the red and the green, the retail and the park or open space um, in terms of the, the retail being a little bit less of the overall area, just generally looking at it. So that's why I would go with C over A personally, because those two aren't equal. And because it kind of gave me pause to say like, how would I know that's multifamily residential versus just residential? So if, if you're studying, um, I mean, I, I don't think you'll have, obviously you won't have this exact question, but you may wanna take a look and on the um, APA website, there's general kind of guidance for land use colors. Um, you know, so take a look at that. And as Morgan mentioned, you know, you typically would see kind of this gradient of yellow to brown. You typically see sort of red for, for retail uses. Take a look at that guidance. And just so you get kind of familiar with what, if, if you're, that's not something that's part of your um, general knowledge base. And again, every community can be slightly different, right? Um, do you use blue for office or do you use, you know, something different? All right. I like those land use questions better than I like these questions, but this one, a stratified sampling is when you do what? I'm going to give everyone just a second to read through this and then I'll go to the questions or the options. I think those were okay, the options, you. Aaron. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> my bad. Yep. <laughs> this is what I get when I'm trying to manage. <laughs> Multiple screens. Yeah. So who, who would like to chime in with the answer on this one? And I, I lost track of the chat, but I think I think I saw mostly A answers on this. Anyone have questions on stratified sampling or anyone that answered um, like to weigh in? A is the correct answer. Okay. Please feel free to speak up if you wanna talk through any of those. I'll be honest with you. We've never really had people um, doing this in chat. It's usually been verbal. So um, if you have questions, um, please let us know. Okay, let's go through two more questions and then we'll take a short break um, just to make sure everyone has a chance to stretch their legs, grab coffee, use the restroom. Um, which of the following are included in subdivision regulations? Okay, I'm seeing D, all of the above coming in. Couple people think maybe it's just one and two. Um, the correct answer is D, all of the above. Um, so subdivision regulations can include and often do include um, recordation, dedication requirements, impact fees, and growth management controls. Now, for those of you who identified one and two, that's that's correct. Um, not all communities have impact fees, not all communities have growth management. Um, so again, don't get tripped up in thinking about your jurisdiction specifically, but if a jurisdiction had impact fees, they would show up in the subdivision regulation. Yeah, and it's 
it's hard if you are specific, you know, if you're specifically working in a place and really familiar with your subdivision regulations, but just know that these are statutorily, this is where you would expect to kind of see these, these things show up. Any questions on that? Looks like most people got that one. Okay. Okay, last question before we stretch. Um, an LOS, so level of service C at a signalized intersection indicates what? Excellent, watching all the responses come in. Um, the correct answer is A, mostly stable flow, but speeds and maneuverability are somewhat constricted by the volume. Um, I know that we have a few transportation planners on the call. Um, Aaron mentioned early on that um, there are several people on this call today. First of all, we have a lot of people on, which is great, it's very exciting. Um, but we all have different focuses. And if there are questions that maybe you're not feeling very comfortable with the subject matter for this purposes of this question, um, not feeling confident with transportation, we would encourage you to, um, if you're comfortable with it, maybe pairing up with someone who does have experience in that field because the tests are typically categorized into about three different groups um, where more of the, and I'm not saying this to freak anybody out, but it's just the fact of it that the um, exams will be more focused on one topic versus another. So if Aaron, Leslie, and I were all taking the exam together, the three of us may get totally different uh, versions of the exam. I might get mine more focused on transportation. Aaron's is more on environmental and Leslie's is more on long range planning. So um, if you're not feeling super confident, we would encourage y'all to maybe pair up with someone who has experience in that field um, that you're just needing some additional assistance to brush up, which is totally fine. Um, so are there any questions on this or thoughts that anybody wants to share? And I think some, sometimes we take for granted that everyone knows what level of service is. Um, it's, on, it's a grading scale, right? And so even if you don't know what level of service is, know that it goes from A to F. I think that's still correct. Transportation friends, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, so, you know, A is great. It's a great level of service. So you, that would probably be B, right? There's free flows, low volumes, everything's great. This is what we all love. Um, F on the other hand would be, D, right? Um, it's not, it's like I-25, right? On a, on a commute day. Um, so even if you don't really know exactly what the definition is, you can kind of apply that grading scale um, and really, um, yes, that's <laughs> silly. So, um, you know, just it, it, even if you're not a transportation planner, um, familiarize yourself with some of those concepts, level of service, volume to capacity ratios, um, and it, it might help you through some of those things. Okay, I am going to go to the next slide um, because, uh, yeah, Miguel. Okay, I am going to go to the next slide. Oh. So, yeah, Miguel. I just want to add to that one too. Like on some, some questions, you'll have a couple of responses you can just uh, eliminate because it doesn't make sense or it's kind of just a stupid response. But with that one in particular, LO, the LOS, every single one of those is an actual LOS a, F, or whatever, they, they're all valid. You just, that one in particular, you know, you can't, they're all an answer to a different LOS. So you can't really um, like eliminate one because it's like, that doesn't make sense. It's just. Yeah, that's a great point. A little bit more tricky if you're not familiar with the concept. Um, okay. We are going to take, what do you guys think? Um, let's come back around, let's take a five minute break. So be back right right around 10.30 or just thereafter. Um, Classic had a question on the study group process. If you're interested in forming a study group, we will leave that to you. Um, I can send out um, contacts, emails and names um, for this group. And if you don't want to be included in that, please let me know, let's say by, um, early next week so that I don't include you. 
Um, and then it's kind of up to you, or you can in the chat right now, um, hey, I'd like to form a study group. I'm taking the test at this time, who's in? Um, you can do that too. So however that's gonna work for you. So if you head out now, classic, you'll get an email um, and you can you know, work through that at your own um, leisure once we send out the, the contact information. Because it looks like you would like to form a nobody a November study group. So if you also want to be in a study group, it looks like Ellie and Classic are going to form one. So contact them. And Emily has just also indicated she's in. So okay, we'll see you guys back. Let's come back at uh, like ten thirty two.
we'll just give everyone a second to get back and then we will resume. Um, can you still see my screen? We're good? Okay. And did we leave it off with you, Leslie, or? Yes, I'm up and sorry, I've got a little bit of background noise it's for the moment, but um, so yes, uh, a complete submission for a site plan review should provide each of the following types of information except for what? And this is probably a good example of where site plan requirements may require different things in different communities. And I'm seeing uh, several answers for C, which is correct. And I think you'd find that there never would be a requirement for specific rents to be listed as part of a site plan, whereas some of these other requirements may or may not be included in your local requirements. Okay, uh, Clarence Perry's neighborhood unit was which of the following? So this is sort of requiring you to know not only what, maybe who Clarence Perry is, although that's not as critical here, um, but what, what is the neighborhood unit um, as defined by Clarence Perry? Um, the correct answer is actually D, all of the above. Um, so I don't know, we've, we've got a lot of folks that thought it did not contain shops at the intersection. Um, yeah, jump in. Sorry, I, I'm just gonna hop in because I, I, reading the the uh, my memory of Clarence Perry is is not the best. But I, I could have sworn it was it was shops at the periphery, which I guess the intersections of those major uh, roadways could be you could interpret that way. But uh, that was kind of my thinking there. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. So thinking about that neighborhood unit as being kind of around a school with those larger major streets on the edge and then shops at the intersections of those major streets, I think what you're saying is correct. It's just sort of thinking about, you know, maybe, you know, we can kind of imagine that graphic with multiple neighborhood units, shops in your mind at the periphery, but sort of at the intersections of those major streets. So I think I think what you're saying is correct. Um, the correct answer is D, all of the above. Um, and I, I think the, the concept here, which might be tripping us up a little, um, Emily, it sounds like you had similar thoughts to Wesley. Um, shops and major roads are at the perimeter of a neighborhood unit. That could be the intersection though, right? Those major roads are the intersections where we would find shops. So I think you're on the right track. Um, just kind of how it's applied. Point being that the shops are um, at the intersections of the roads, not, you know, not in the middle. Okay. Okay. Which of the following is a landmark housing case? So watching the responses come in, the correct response is C, Southern Burlington NAACP versus Township of Mount Laurel. Um, are there, so first, th yes, this is a memorization question, um, but just to jog everybody's memory, this was um, focused on, well, actually, before I get to that, 
process of elimination, I think we're all very familiar with Euclid, um, hopefully. So Euclidean type zoning. Um, so D is focused on zoning. There is a takings case for B and um, A is also a zoning case. So process, again, process of elimination, mark those out. C is um, the housing case. So the notes that we have, and I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this from your studies, um, but the plaintiffs were those who um, were mostly lower socioeconomic um, status from um, this area and kind of just like briefly going through here, um, suitable housing was of a concern. Plaintiffs argued that the defendant, um, the township had effectively excluded them from the municipality through its land use regulations. And this is something that generally, you know, while we're not always calling the case by name, this is something that as planners we're very mindful of or should be very mindful of. Um, to ensure there's housing for all and that we're not implementing any policies that would um, exclude others. So any questions on this? Okay. All right, so for this one, uh, the question is the three levels of the ladder of participation are which of the following? Hey, we have a variety of answers on this one. Does somebody feel uh, confident that they'd like to share their response and, and why they came up with that? And if not, I'll jump in. So the answer is D. Um, and this is an example of a planning theory that's helpful to be familiar with. Um, I think you could look at this question also if you're not as familiar with the theory or you hadn't studied it specifically, community involvement is a, is a, just a general concept, whereas these other um, types of participation are very specific to the theory. Um, so uh, citizen power, tokenism, and non-participation are, are what's included in that ladder of participation. And again, thinking about levels, you could sort of, even if you didn't really know this theory, say, well, yeah, at the bottom, non-participation's nothing. Yeah, Tokenism is kind of in the middle and then really citizen power would be at the top, right? So thinking about it in more of that level and to your point, Leslie, community involvement is sort of what participation is, right? Yeah, exactly. So you can often pick out clues from the question itself. And as, as Aaron said, you know, this is really getting at that concept of, of the levels and the different um, rungs on the ladder. So that can help you sort out maybe some of the ones that just don't make sense from that standpoint. Okay, so you are newly appointed planning director in the small town of Buckville. Your husband's the owner of a gardening store that's applying to construct a greenhouse to be built adjacent to the store. The greenhouse will need to be reviewed by the planning commission. So in this example, what should you do? I'm going to go to the options. So this is starting to get towards some of those ethics questions. And it looks like most of you as the planning director would inform the commission about your connection and remove yourself, which is the correct answer. So, and I think, you know, for those of us who think about ethics, a lot of the questions that come up are around conflict of interest. And so this is a really good example of some of the things, not only that you might see on the test, but that you might be and may already be facing in your, in your profession. Okay, who was the father of zoning? Another memorization question.
with this one, I would say that there is for sure a push to confuse the test taker. Having all these options start with the letter B. <laughs> so the correct answer is C. Um, a, known for concentric circle planning. B, known for comp plans. Also a lawyer for Euclid, which I will say that that is just a note that we have. You do not have to know who all the attorneys are in those court cases. And if you if you just want to and have a lot of time, that's excellent. Um, D was known for the um, World Expo. So the plan of Chicago and process of elimination gets us back to C. So father of planning, I'm sorry, father of zoning. All the more tricky because they all had something to do with planning. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So on this one, um, what housing act focused on slum clearance in particular? I've seen a smattering of answers. The correct answer in this case is, is um, the Housing Act of 1949, so C. Um, and this is a, probably a case of really studying up on these housing acts, I think, especially now with so much conversation and talk around housing, um, understanding the history back through the decades and the various acts and, and what happened in the 1950s and 1960s through, you know, through late last century and even more co contemporary um, legislative affairs would be helpful. Um, so 1949, this was uh, dealt with federal financing for slum, slum clearance programs associated with urban renewal projects in American cities. Um, the act of 1954 actually created public housing um, 1964 was the Fair Housing Act, and that was intended to protect the buyer or the renter of a dwelling from sell it, from the seller or the land landlord discrimination. Um, and then the 1970 Act actually focused on raising the ceiling on guarantees for new communities to $500 million. Um, so that made larger projects feasible. So um, that's just a, a little bit of information about various housing acts. So that would be something to take a look at in your, in your studying. I had a quick question. Um, so I was looking at another practice test and they said the Housing Act of 1937, I just wanna know if this can be confirmed. Mm -hmm. They just said they started to tie slum clearance to public housing, but it wasn't until 1949, that's when they provided the federal financing for some clearance, is that correct? 1949 is when they provided federal financing, that's correct. I'm yeah. less familiar with the 1937 Act. Aaron or Morgan, do you know? I, I don't, but I will say that this is one of the questions that came up earlier in our study session about needing to know the years. And this is a perfect example of why. Um, over time, these, the different, um, you know, I'll call it call for action with the housing acts will evolve. And, you know, like Leslie said, this may have happened, but then at this date, then, well, this is when federal funding was granted. So um, being mindful of maybe more of what that focus was for the specific year, because there are so many housing acts, you know, the, the establishment of HUD, so I will say that from whenever I took my exam, I do remember that there was a very specific question about a housing act in the specific year. And luckily I was just really hyper-focused on them for whatever reason when I was studying. So I, I'm assuming I got that one correct, but um, there is a timeline and it might be something that I put together, but I, I would encourage y'all to go through and search, you know, housing act history. And I'm hesitating because I'm trying to remember where I found that, but I will look for it. And if there's something profound that I'm able to find, I will share that with everybody. 
Morgan, there's a timeline that I know I put together and shared okay. that on our website. Um, maybe that that's what it has is. Milestones. Okay. I think Emily, in this case, you know, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of housing acts, um, and so this is sort of confusing. Um, I think the the thing that maybe you could do if that's not been your focus, um, it has not been my housing has not been my focus, particularly um, former housing acts, is kind of think about. Um, the progression of things and what came first, right? So in your case, um, you know, this question would have been made extremely difficult and almost impossible if the Housing Act of 1937 was included. Um, the fact that it's not, and you know that both of those focused on slum clearance, one providing actual financing for it. Um, you know, I think that's, if, if I were taking the exam and there was a question like that, that's kind of what I would take away. Um, you know, I think you can also think about the progression of like, okay, when were we really focused on urban renewal projects and what had to happen before we could do that? You know, it's like, well, clearly 19, even 1964, certainly 1970 is probably too late. Um, you know, so maybe just thinking about how can you group things? How can you think about um, the eras? And I think to an earlier point, the decades in which things were done and what was the progression of things, right? Like. First, we had slum clearance, we had financing, then we had public housing, then we had fair housing, um, you know, and then to Leslie's point, thinking about some of the things that have happened since then. And I think some of those law cases might also help you with some of those things. So I wouldn't get too tripped up on that, but I think you are correct um, in thinking about there's there are additional housing um, acts and legislation that happened beyond just these. All right, thank you. Okay, so um, when do we celebrate National Community Planning Month? It is correct, it's in October. So we should all be celebrating right now. We should have sent you guys cupcakes or something we could have had a celebration, okay. Um, so according to ITE's trip generation, blank trips per day per dwelling unit will be generated by single family homes. Okay, I will say that one response came in with a question mark after it. I appreciate the honesty of not knowing if it's so let, let's talk about this one. Um, the correct response, and I'll I'll talk as y'all are still sending them in. The correct response is A. So single family uh trips is for purposes of this question, 9.52. The thought with this is that as the buildings get taller, the trips get smaller. Um, also thinking of development patterns that if you are in a single family development versus high rise, the need to drive is most likely higher. Um, you know, and this is not something that's specific to all situations. So remembering to not make everything hyper-personalized, um, but that is the thought with this. And I think we've talked about this before, Erin and Leslie, help me, um, the trip generation, a document for that I believe was shared, or maybe it was a participant that was on a previous study session, shared that with everybody. Do you so want to Yes, um, so the trip generation manual, and certainly like Miguel or other transportation planners jump in here. Um, I don't think you need to memorize all the trip generation rates for different land uses, right? And frankly, someone can tell me differently. I don't use this a ton, but these numbers could be changed. Mm -hmm. um, the point here and the thing that you should remember is what Morgan said. And again, just think back to land use patterns, right? When, when are you able to... Um, not have as many trips by cars, right? It's it's not when you're in lower density single family areas. Um, so as buildings get taller, trips get smaller, right? That's that's kind of the the trick here. Um, obviously, that's more for like residential and mixed use buildings. Um, but generally, 
when you're talking about residential uses, single family detached, lower density um, neighborhoods have the highest trip generation rates as compared with um, low rise apartments, high rise or mixed use. Um, so. Miguel. Yeah. And just to add to that as well, like if you kind of just think about it in general, like a single family home, those are typically fine in your suburban communities. And so if you think about a sub suburban community and a single family home character and makeup, you know, you have two parents, you have a couple of kids in that family household, probably two cars for that home. So you think of all the trips that they're making in and out of the, their home, each parent, you know, going to work, each child going to school, probably an after, after work or after school activity. So each trip that's leaving and going to and from those homes, you know, that's, that's a lot for the suburban communities. So that's, the number is going to be high. Yeah, great point, Miguel. So thinking about the composition of the household as well. Um, Miguel, just in thinking about um, other uses, any rules of thumb on like office or industrial? Um, obviously, I would assume sort of that warehousing and distribution um, would have higher trip generation rates, certainly like medical office, those that, you know, if you can think about customers coming and there being a lot of changeover, like a medical office would have far more than, you know, uh, a call center where people are coming for a shift. Any, any yeah. other rules of thumb? Yeah, that's that's a good one. I'm not too familiar with those ones, but like industrial one for sure. Like, um, you know, there's there's all the truck traffic, so that that's one that you can focus on. It's going to be mostly truck traffic, not necessarily like um, these like single family trips in comparison, I guess. And then I'm not too familiar with the commercial one, but. Yeah, so yeah in that sense, I just think of the parking that's in there. So it seemed like there would be a lot of. Yeah, so this could be one where even if you and probably 90% of people on this call don't have trip generation rates memorized, think about the type of activity that would be coming and going from a use. Think about those nuances um, and, you know, kind of make that educated assumption. Okay. All right, so which of these people was involved with an organizational approach that has invitations sent out to the neighborhood or organization and a paid organizer is then sent to the neighborhood? And I'm seeing a few answers B, which is correct. Does anybody want to say more about who Saul Olinsky was and why the other ones are not correct? Okay, I'll jump in. So uh, Saul Olinsky was a, a community activist in the Chicago area, and he did exactly what is noted here on the slide. So he um, helped poor communities and uh, press demands on landlords and um, work with uh, residents to um, advocate. Um, these other folks also were planners. Um, Paul Davidoff was an advocacy planner. Um, Sherry Arnstein was the, the author of the ladder question that you saw earlier, the citizen participation ladder. And then um, TJ Kent was involved with uh, developing the concepts around urban general planning. So um, this is a matter of, of just understanding some of the planning history and theory and knowing a, a little bit about each of these people and what they did. Okay. What does zip code stand for? Not something we probably think about often, but it looks like most of you got this. The answer is a zone improvement plan code. Not a planning term, so it's not related to zoning. 
Okay. We've okay. Got another... Oh, sorry. Do you want to read Go that ahead. one? Nope. It's you. <laughs> nope. Um, so we have another ethics question. Um, you are a village planner scheduled to attend a plan commission meeting to provide a staff recommendation on a case. Prior to the meeting, you receive a phone call from a friend and colleague who is a planner in a nearby community. She tells you that she has some dirt on the petitioner who is scheduled to present on this case. She says that you won't believe your ears and that although this information is confidential, you have to hear it. You're afraid that this could impact your staff recommendation. What should you do? So watching the responses come in, the correct answer is D. Tell her that if she has anything to say, that it should be done during the public comment uh, during the plan commission meeting this evening. Um, you know, as regular humans, I'm sure we would all love to hear the hot goss, but being mindful of what your profession is and the code of ethics that we are all um, bound by, even if you are not AICP, there is an expectation for all planners. So, um, you know, making that separation, saying, please just come share the information if you feel so inclined during public comment. Okay. Okay, an impact, environmental impact statement can be defined as which of the following? Okay, I'm seeing mostly B answers, which is correct. Um, it's written to satisfy the requirements of NEPA, which is the National Environmental Policy Act, um, when a major action will have a significant impact on the environment. Um, there's some other acronyms in here. EIR is Environmental Impact Report. Um, and this is a good example of having some familiarity with environmental cases that progressed through and acts that happened through time and basic requirements around environmental policy. Are there any questions or thoughts? There's a question here. A is more related to environmental. I'm not sure if I understand the question about A. Yeah, so environmental okay. impact assessment, correct. Isn't an environmental impact statement a lesser review than some of the other actions under NEPA? Yes. And so, but the under B, they talk about a major action. Yes, if there, if it's if if it will have a significant impact, correct. But then oh. is, isn't for environmental impact statement, don't, isn't it, it's like F-I-O-N-S, even if there isn't a statement, even if there isn't an impact, they still have to report that there was no, there was findings of no significant impact. Um, so isn't that still part of it? Because and even though it's it's like oh never mind I guess I just answered my own question. <laughs> Victoria, hi. Um, I work in NEPA, um, and I'm not sure if this has already been covered, but the way that I think about it, and I've done it, an environmental assessment is done on projects where they're evaluating whether or not. There would be a significant impact of a federal action that would result in a FONSI, a finding of no significant impact, but there, if there is, then they would proceed to an environmental impact statement, which is an extensive environmental review that results in a, rec um, a record of decision, a ROD. But other times, if an agency, um, e either it's a really complex or political issue or project, they'll default to an EIS um, or if they 
know that it's going to be a significant impact, they'll, they'll go straight to the EIS. So I hope that helps. So Victoria, kind of with the earlier line of questioning, the EA environmental assessment would be done first. And if there was anticipated to be that more significant impact, then they would do the environmental impact statement. Is that? Um, if there's an anticipated significant impact, an agency would very likely just do an EIS. You don't have to do an EA before doing an EIS. Um, so the EIS, you could like the um, answer A, the most extensive environmental review underneath that is an EIS. Um, does that answer the question? Sorry if I misunderstand. So the key for the question here is B is the correct answer because it's a major action and it's a significant impact. Yes. Okay. There was a, a few questions on this. Does everyone, I really appreciate you jumping in Victoria. Um, my specialty is not um, NEPA. So that was really helpful. Okay. And it sounds like if you have specific questions on environmental impact statements and NEPA environmental assessments, Victoria might be a great resource for you if you're willing, Victoria. Okay, so moving on, a nonconformity can be defined as what? How would you define nonconformity? Looks like we've got several answers and consensus that the correct re response is C, which is correct, uses and structures that existed prior to the zoning ordinance and are not in conformity. Doesn't seem like there's many questions, but please speak up if you have a question. Okay. okay. The polycentric concept can be described as which of the following? I'm waiting for responses to comment. So um, the correct answer for this is B, metropolitan regions developed in a series of centers. Um, so the key here may be um, that this is polycentric. So there's multiple points. Um, so with that said, A could automatically be eliminated as that is a single, um, but this is one of those memorization um, is there anybody that has a question about this or want to share their thoughts? Okay. Right, another land use question. So advantages of subdivision regulations include which of the following? Right. appears to be all B answers, which is correct. This is probably a good one to do a process of elimination on because the, the last one really doesn't make any sense at all in terms of regulations related to subdivisions. <laughs> um, what is a strip of mostly level land bordering a stream or river? that's subject to flooding called. Okay, we've got mostly A's, a C in there. The correct answer is a floodplain. I think the key here, um, it could be, a, there could be a marsh um, bordering a stream or river, but the key here is it's subject to flooding. Um, again, a mar marsh could also be subject to flooding. A marsh would likely be in a floodplain. 
but I think the, the best answer here is a floodplain. And that's more likely to be a strip of land. <laughs> yeah, good point, Leslie, thank you. All right, the policy Delphi method can be defined as what? Another example of a question in that public participation category. And the responses that are coming in are all correct. The answer for this one is A, successive rounds of argument and counter argument that work towards a consensus. Okay, if you were just at the state conference, you might've seen Peter Calthorpe there talking about transit-oriented development. So which of the following are common principles of that? Okay, the last few have been answering C, which is correct. And that's basically all of them except for um, the four, uh, all of them except for the third one. <laughs> Any questions around that concept? I will say that in the past, we've had some debate on um, this question particularly around um, including access for vehicles. And so I think, um, you know, to your point, Leslie, the, the one we can say for sure is not part of TOD is lower density development. Um, and so I think this is one where you could really benefit from maybe not thinking about your own specific community or um, code that, that you may have seen and oftentimes there is consideration, many times there is consideration for vehicles as well. And how are we getting people from their cars um, to transit? Certainly pedestrians are a big piece of that, but I'll just mention that was, I, I don't know that that's something that came up in your responses, but I know that's something we've had lots of conversations about in past sessions. So mm -hmm. great job to all of you. Okay, we've got just a couple more questions. I'm gonna get through these quickly so we can go on to resources. Um, for those environmental folks here, this will be good for you. Um, these are deep lakes that have low supply of nutrients and thus contain little organic matter. And I think we are seeing A, which is the correct answer. So just definitions again. This is pulling from maybe middle school knowledge. Um, what is the range of the following data set? So being familiar with mean, median, mode, range. Some quick math. My middle again, school must everybody not- everybody did their, their homework. Was, Sorry, go ahead, Leslie. I was gonna say that was high school for me. So your middle school must have been more advanced. Okay, let's be clear. <laughs> Growing up in Texas, it's not like we're known for the best <laughs> education system. So it probably was high school. <laughs> I have even been college. I can't remember for sure. <laughs> I know that we did it in stats class, which was definitely college. So who knows? Um, but the correct answer is D7. Okay, so this type of tool can be described as a device to provide flexibility within the zoning ordinance. Which of the following? So this is a tricky one. So think it is tricky. Question. It's within the zoning ordinance. So within your code or within a code, I should say. Yeah, and so the correct answer is A, 
Um, I think a few might have answered C, a variance, which is which is a tool to provide some flexibility and relief, but generally from dimensional standards, setback requirements, and that sort of thing, as opposed to from zoning itself, which would have to do with land uses. I think the key, Leslie, in what you just said is a variance provides relief from the ordinance and there's a separate process that you would get a variance. Um, a special use permit is a process that's within the actual zoning code, right? And so it provides yeah. a mechanism for flexibility versus that relief. And this is a term that can vary quite a bit from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So it might be special use, it might be special review. Um, there's there's a lot of ways of terming that within individual zoning ordinances and codes. So, so be careful about that too, that it may not be exactly what you're used to. So Kate, to your question, I don't think this is saying a special use permit would change zoning. I think what it might say is that um, there's some uses that you can go through a separate review for, and you can get a special use permit, but there might be some additional standards that you need to meet, and those would be spelled out in your code. So it's not um, it's not giving you something that's different from the zoning. It's built into the zoning. So it provides flexibility. So um, you'd be able to get a permit, but you're going to have to meet additional standards. Or you're going to have to go through a separate review, but it's built into the code. So it's not changing zoning. Um, it's providing flexibility within the actual zoning. Does that answer your question? And, and that's a, a really good distinction. Yeah, and if you have other questions, we can talk we can talk more about that. And there's probably some folks that have that built into their codes that could provide some specific examples. Is that, does that answer your question, Kate? Yeah, okay, okay. Okay, so this is a pretty specific question. Um, what are key points to writing a WBS? Um, And WBS is um, work breakdown structure, in case you didn't know that. That's something, obviously, that's important to know if you're answering this question. And Amber, you are correct. Miguel, good job. Uh, D, all of the above. So if you are drafting a work breakdown structure, you need to do all of these things. This type of land use can be described as being allowed by right and somewhat builds upon one of the previous questions. So the correct answer is C, permitted use. Um, from this perspective, a special use permit may say that so making the connection between this and the previous question that we were talking about, um, you know, conditional use, there may be some additional requirements the applicant must adhere to so that the use is permitted, um, but it's not one of those that's straight up permitted, single family zone district, you can build a single family home, maybe you could do something else like a duplex, but it's a special use permit or a conditional use. There are additional requirements that have to be met before it can be approved. Um, accessory uses, that may be something that's permitted by right, but focusing on the principal use um, in general for this. Yeah, and I think that's an important distinction. I know we, we did see a few with that accessory use. Those can be allowed in, in districts, but permitted use is you know, you oftentimes wouldn't be able to have an accessory use unless you had a mm -hmm. permitted use. You, I don't know in a case where you could ever. Um, and so again, thinking about what's the best answer here. Okay. Okay, which of the following could describe the term earned value?
Okay, good. Looks like most of you have answered D, which is it's a project a method for measuring the progress of a project against the plan. So this is a project management, project administration type of term and, and tool that you may be more familiar with if you're in the private sector. <laughs> Um, it's not one that I've personally used a lot, but um, it's a good one to be familiar with. Okay, how would you define exactions? Okay, looks like consensus around C that is correct. Exactions are the subdividers financial responsibility for public improvements associated with the development. And there's some, definitely some law cases around this term. So that could be another way to help you. Okay, what final. is, oh, sorry. Nope, go. I'm sorry, I'm adding commentary that I don't need to add. Are you sure? Yep. Okay. <laughs> What is a disadvantage to shift share analysis? And I will admit this is something that I have not had to do. So Ellie, love the question mark after you are all correct. The answer is A, it does not discount the effect of abnormal events. And reading through the answer here, I believe and Leslie and Aaron, help me if you have other thoughts on this. I believe it's because the shift share analysis is primarily focusing on the strengths and weaknesses of a specific region's industries, um, which comes from national growth, industry mix, and competitiveness. So it's those things that can be measured rather than something that you throw in a situation that is not expected. Right, so it's comparing those against two periods in time. So if you're not, let's say there's a crazy abnormal event like a pandemic, it wouldn't necessarily be able to consider that abnormal event. Okay. Last question. Okay. TDRs, transfer of development rights, do which of the following? All right, and many of you are quick to answer D, which is correct. It's all of these things. So basically it's a market where one landowner can sell development rights to another landowner and you have sending and receiving areas. And it's a tool that was used, I would say a lot more maybe 20 years ago than, than it is now, but still, still a valid tool for looking at protecting lands or trying to encourage density in, in certain locations. Um, oftentimes with a city and a county maybe involved together. I know we've got some folks from um, the Boulder County area, and this is a tool that is used um, to some degree still, but certainly to your point, Leslie, maybe a little bit more previously. But we do have some good local examples of this. Yep. Okay, um, great job, everyone. Again, you know, just really the benefit of that is kind of talking through things and thinking about how we would think through things, not specific questions. So please don't don't spend a ton of time memorizing specific Q&A from this test. Um, we want to spend the last little bit of our time going through some tips and resources and feel free to jump in here um, as you have thoughts. It sounds like some of you have already started studying. Some of you have taken the test before. So welcome this to be an open dialogue. And I'll turn it over to Morgan. All right. So um, it looks like we're kind of split half and half for those who are taking the exam um, next month. So about nine of the people who are on the call are looking to take it in November, about seven in the spring, and then the rest are maybe undetermined, which is absolutely okay. There is never a set time that um, you have to start studying or you know, I want to take it this time, so therefore I will. Prepping yourself to get comfortable with what the exam will look like. Um, you know, we've talked about it a little bit today, but if you're looking for additional resources, the APA National does have information on the website. So just looking through that to familiarize yourself. 
And next slide. So whenever you're studying, I know that several of us, and you know, for those who have already taken the exam, maybe it was something that you had to get into of remembering how to study. Whenever I took my exam, it was definitely one of those feelings of how the heck did I do this every day for so many years? Um, but when you get back into preparing for the exam, knowing what works best for you. So um, there are some people who maybe need to say everything out loud so that they can remember it, um, writing flashcards, writing things down. I have a gigantic binder of all the notes that I took whenever I was preparing, but it's, it's about what makes sense for you. Um, as Aaron has said a few times on this call, if you want to get a study group put together, we can absolutely help you with that, but recognize that maybe it doesn't work for everybody. I met with somebody when I was taking my exam every other week, we would go through some of those questions just to kind of feed, you know, back and forth off of each other of, well, this is how I read it. How did you read it? And it was really helpful um, to get someone else's perspective. Uh, we've thrown out some tips throughout today's study session. And one of those is not focusing on something if you're already familiar with it. So focusing your energy on, um, you know, I'm not really familiar with the Supreme Court cases. That was what was needed for me. I do not have a degree in planning. I have related fields, but it was something that I wasn't familiar with it and didn't go through it when I was in school. So um, focusing your time and energy on what makes sense for you so that you are able to use your time wisely. So next slide. Definitely recommend, um, like we did today, going through some of those practice tests. Um, there are resources online, um, planning, shoot, I can't remember what it is. It might, I, I know that it's in our resource document that we have, but there is a website that has some of some older practice exams. As Aaron has said many times today, please do not memorize the test questions on these practice uh, tests and quizzes because they will be different than what you have on your exam. Um, also, if you're using those different resources, maybe through APA or Planetizen, where they have the practice tests and quizzes, please do not beat yourself up on um, if you're not scoring well. Those practice tests and quizzes are intended to be more difficult than the actual exam itself. A lot of what this is doing is preparing you to take the exam and getting your mind in that frame of how do I take this test? So please do not beat yourself up. I will say that whenever I was doing that, I was failing most of them, crying a lot. I don't want you to feel that way because more than likely, it's going to be easier when you take the exam itself. Um, as we've said a lot today, do not personalize the information. So this exam is intended for the nation as a whole, as well as some planner planners who may be overseas. Um, the questions are intended to be pretty general. So um, not making it something that, well, if I were to do this on you know Tuesday at my job, what would I do? Reading it from a more general standpoint. And, and Morgan, I, I found too, when I was taking those tests, when I would get something wrong, that was a good um, kind of signal to me that those are the concepts I should really mm -hmm. focus more on. So it was just a good tool from that standpoint, really focus on concepts as opposed to memorization. Yes. Very good point, Leslie. I remember when I was studying, I kept getting questions that were focused on um, tribal regulations and native history. And so what I ended up doing was putting together a whole list of things that, okay, clearly I, I'm missing this every time. So what are some of those facts that I need to focus on? Did I end up having any of those questions on my exam? No, but I felt a lot more confident after I went through and studied them. Okay, so um, we've also mentioned this, there are some resources on the national website and there are um, really, really good resources on various state chapters. So there were some comments in the chat earlier about the list of Supreme Court cases and that Pennsylvania has a great list. Pennsylvania has amazing resources, as does Florida and Ohio. And I'm saying this because I'm from there. Shockingly, Texas has some good resources too, but 
going through and finding that information. Um, it's an open forum, essentially, for sharing the information that other states have. And I don't, I don't think we have this on a slide, but something that has come up, the state of Florida has um, a study session that you can sign up for with Henry, help me, Aaron and Leslie. Whitaker. Thank you. Um, you can sign up for an exam prep that he conducts every, I think every year, every. Um, it's twice a year. It's like yes. Eight, eight to 10 weeks. So if you're taking the exam in November, it may be a little late, but yeah. um, if you're going to do the spring exam, you know, check into that early. The only requirement is that you are an APA member, um, mm -hmm. which if you're going to take the AICP, you likely are. Um, so you'll see in the chat, I just put our resource sheet. You'll see the link to that Florida um, prep. And and we've heard, none of us, I don't think, have ever taken it. Mm -hmm. uh, but now that they're doing that virtually, he's like, opened that to any other chapter. Mm -hmm. And we've heard that it's it's really great. It goes into a lot more detail around specific content. And so I think it's, again, I think it's an eight to 10 week, every week yeah. um, workshop. And I think you can find them on YouTube too. I, I believe some of the past recordings are available. So even if you can't sign up and take the full course now, you may be able to have access to past courses. Oh, and it sounds like Molly's doing that right now. And it's three hours for about 10 weeks and very dense. Because remember, the exam is the same for everybody. So if you find something in another state, it's still applicable. Um, all of us, we're all taking the same exam. So um, finding those resources and sharing them, if you feel so inclined with this group, would be excellent. So next slide. I won't hang out too much here um, because Aaron went over how the exam is divided up earlier today. Um, so just kind of reminding you that there are specific topics that are going to be on the exam. And again, focusing on more on those that you're not as familiar with than others um, so that you are spending your time wisely. And I'll just add here, Morgan, some of us that have created documents to help ourselves. Like I mentioned, I did a timeline, you know, the history timeline law, those are up on our Colorado website. So they're by no means, you know, an end all be all. They're not, at least if, unless someone's updated at the law, one's not current after 2007. But, you know, there's, there's lots of resources out there on specific topics that can help you in developing your own flashcards or taking that as a starting point, adding to it. So just know that those are out there as a resource for you. There are several different guides that can be found. Um, I mentioned that APA does have a study session. I am not familiar with it, um, nor do I know anyone personally who took it. I use the Planetizen study guide, and that was something that was beneficial for me. I am not saying that everybody should do that, uh, knowing myself well enough and how I need to study. Um, Emily, you mentioned that you do feel some test anxiety. I felt that so hard. I I know that I overstudied. I did psych myself out. Um, I did as much as I could. Could I have probably whittled that back? Absolutely. Um, but just you know, knowing what works best for you with that study exam, it was not a study um, resource. It was not free at the time that I did it. It was a little less than $300. So it is um, a personal investment that you will need to make. If that, again, if it is something that you think it'll work for you, absolutely pursue that. And here's the, the website that I could not recall, planningprep.com. There are some free exams on there. Um, I know that they are significantly older. So again, please do not memorize them. There are some um, flashcard apps, if that's what would be beneficial for you. Um, Quizlet is one, but being mindful of the fact that several of those different apps or websites that you may find are open forums, so anybody can create those different flashcards. So just making sure that when you're looking through them that it is the correct information so that you are not memorizing incorrect um, facts, which I would say that the hope is that nobody's intentionally doing that, but just being mindful of it when you're doing that. Because it's one of those things that you can do whenever you're just kind of maybe 
going somewhere on a trip and can mindlessly go through those flashcards to keep everything fresh. Okay. And I know um, Morgan Ellie did mention that planning prep has some outdated census questions as a heads up. So mm -hmm. I think the tests that might be on there, I want to say are, you know, 10 or so years old. Yep. So clearly the exam has changed in that time, but it, it is something that we've talk a lot about with our committee and with other PDOs throughout the um, nation, it's difficult to give, uh, you know, people want to do exams um, because it gives you confidence and helps you, you know, potentially reduce that test anxiety, but it's a challenge when we don't have actual questions. And so think about what's going to be most helpful to you, but re do recognize that what you're going to get may, won't be specific questions and maybe a little outdated. So figure out what's most useful to you. Yeah. And as, as Leslie said, you know, when she was going through and recognizing that I keep missing these questions, if you're going through um, the planning prep or just older exams, like Aaron mentioned, if there are questions about the census, yes, they will be outdated. So maybe with that, checking out the census website, because they do have some summaries for various trends and finding that information so that it is more current and you feel more confident and comfortable with um, more of our recent data. YouTube has a lot of resources. So for example, today we're recording this, we've recorded several of our study sessions in the past, and there are different um, chapters that may upload some of their videos to YouTube. I would say it's not going to be something where it's a 15 minute or 20 minute that um, the information download and you've got it all. It will be multiple hours, but it's it's great to know that um, resources for our exam, and I say ours because it's, um, you know, compared to um, studying for the bar exam or nurses, they're, they're, you can find all different resources for various exams, um, which whenever you take your exam in the test center, there are going to be a lot of different people in there taking exams for various certifications. Um, but it's great that YouTube does have some resources, um, if that's something that's helpful for you to listen and take notes as you're going through those, um, definitely check that out. And our last few slides are some quotes from um, previous test takers and what helped them. Study Buddy, of course, doing that if it's something that you're comfortable with and we can get you paired up. The great thing about doing these uh, study sessions online is that we are able to reach more people within our state, but also nationally. So I would say that this is the first time I think we've had 100% Colorado participation, but there have been some um, study sessions that we had representation from like seven different states, which is great. Um, and they were able to pair up and make new planner friends across the country. But if, again, if it's something that you're comfortable with, we will get you paired up with a study buddy. Um, this is something that I recognized whenever I was taking my exam and studying. It made me feel more confident and comfortable with being a planner. Um, yes, it was something great to have letters behind my name, um, but better understanding different theories and the history of why we do what we do. So this, you know, studying for your exam, yeah, the ultimate goal is um, passing and becoming an AICP planner, but also making you feel more confident, professional. In our last slide, this is probably my favorite because it's true. Memorizing everything does suck, but it's something that will help you get through, um, you know, retaining that information for the time of the exam. Um, not saying that you should just completely forget everything, but um, figuring out a way that is helpful for you to remember those different facts. Maybe um, I did this. I will say, I don't remember any of them, so please do not call me for it, um, but coming up with little jingles and songs so I could remember stuff, um, various acronyms as planners. We love our acronyms. So just doing whatever it takes um, so you can remember those um, things for maybe like um, the, the father of planning, the father of zoning, the father of this, the father of that, um, different things that is 100% memorization rather than applying different theories. So. That is it that I have for my spiel. And oops, this is. I just realized as I was before going yeah. to the slide that I, Leslie, I will 
update this with your contact info before I send this out to folks. Um, Caitlin is, is obviously not with us today. Um, she could, I'm sure, still be a resource for you. Um, but I will definitely add Leslie's contact info and update my own contact info because I no longer oh, work with Miguel and Aaron. So um, this is, yeah, I will update this before I send it out to you all. Um, I would just end with saying, obviously, good luck. Um, you know, for those of you that are taking the exam the first time, good luck for those that may be taking it a second or third or even fourth time. Um, it's a challenging test. And I think, you know, the fact that you're all here shows that you're committed and you're studying. Um, it doesn't mean you're not a great planner if you don't pass on your first time, if you don't pass on your third time. Um, we've, we've had personal experiences with a lot of folks who have taken the exam multiple times, are amazing planners and are now um, AICP certified. So you can do it. We are here to help you. Um, if there are specific questions that come up, it's completely fine to email me. And I am not an expert in everything. Um, there's a lot of things that I don't do well as a planner, um, but we have a great network of planners in our state. And we have a lot of folks on our board that are really committed to seeing planners succeed in this exam. So if you have a specific question, even if it's very specific, like I've spent a lot of time with folks on like FAR is a good example, going through calculations. We are happy to help you, um, either the three of us are, or getting you connected to other folks that have different expertise. So certainly if you've, um, that is not my correct email, Miguel. Um, thank you for, for recognizing that. I'm gonna put my new email in the chat here. Um, I did work with Miguel and Yuri, so. Um, if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we are here to support you. I put the resource guide in um, our chat and um, we will send that out. So take a look at it. There's lots of links in there. Um, figure out, use some of the things that Morgan talked about to figure out what's gonna be most successful and um, best of luck to you. Stay in touch. We hope to celebrate with you. Um, either at the conference next year or whenever you may be AICP. So with that, um, we'll ask if there's any um, ending questions, anything we covered today, anything that we didn't cover that you had hoped we would cover. I have one quick question. Um, could you guys just go over the years of the generations just because I'm seeing different years on different resources so like what's considered like generation x versus millennial um I would want to look at if there's a specific APA resource that Emily I wouldn't um get too worried about um I don't think there's going to be a question that says does Gen X end in 1979 or 1980? Um, I think knowing general trends, similar to what we asked around which demographic group prefer might you might, might succeed better with a male survey versus a digital survey. Um, I certainly have my own thoughts on those generational benchmarks, but I think you're right there sometimes is nuance. So I will go look and see if APA has that resource. And if so, I'll add it or I'll, I can email you. Um, but I wouldn't get too focused on like, again, you know, the one or two year differences where some people, um, add, you know, where there's nuance. All right. Thank you. Question on how much time did you all spend studying? I think you're exactly right. There's a wide range. Um, some of it is frankly, are you a great test taker? You know, I had the luxury of being a good test taker. Um, and so I didn't get test anxiety. I still studied quite a bit. Um, I didn't, I took the exam in 2007. So it's been a while. Um, I think it's probably fair to say, I'm hopeful you've started studying if you're taking the exam in November. Um, you know, it's not to say that you can't succeed if you haven't started studying, but I think most of what we hear are people start studying a few months in, ex in advance. And then, you know, really that maybe four to six weeks before the exam really start ramping up and trying to do something, you know, depending on what your work schedule and your personal life hold, um, trying to do something at least, you know, um, several times a week. It may be listening to a podcast. It may be doing flashcards while you're working out, whatever works for you. Looks like Ellie's done a hundred hours since April. 
um, 50 hours since August. So, um, you know, I think it really just depends on you um, and your level of comfort. It really, at the end of the day, what works for you may be different. Um, for me, we I had a study group that met probably for a few months every week. And we spent three to four hours on a Saturday kind of just going through things and talking through things. So, um, you know, Morgan, Leslie, others on the call that haven't weighed in any. I, I mentioned, I know I studied too much that I kind of psyched myself out, but I, I think I started, I took the exam in November and I started studying in April and, um, without giving specifics. Cause again, it was, I went way too hard. It was, uh, I'll say a number of hours every day. Yeah. And for me, like Aaron, I, um, am generally a good test taker. I found that the hardest thing was just carving out the time to study and, you know, really finding the times that work for you. As she said, for me, it was, I was a consultant at the time I had airplane rides and, times that were quiet when I was away from my family or after my daughter went to bed. And, you know, so three or four hours a week for a couple of months, basically, um, just carving out the time. It's not a test that you can wait until the last minute and cram for. It's definitely one you need to kind of just dedicate the time and, and at whatever level of comfort you have. And the last thing I would mention, if, if many of you, if you're employed, um, you know, you may check with your employer if they're willing to pay for your exam. You know, there's a potential that they could allow you to have some time to, to prep. They may be even able, some employers are willing to pay for preparatory workshops and things. So that might be something to explore. Um, and yeah, Amber, thank you for mentioning this, a study group in your department that meets once a week. Um, I know there's a few groups out there, so it sounds like this would be a great resource. And Amber, you're, it looks like you're willing to open this up. So um, definitely sounds like something that would be beneficial. So get in touch with Amber if you're interested in, in joining that group, meeting once a week. Any other questions or thoughts, words of wisdom? Okay, well, I will, I'm gonna give everyone a, a little bit to let me know if they don't wanna be included in the um, roster that I'll, I'll send out. We'll, we'll download this and put it on our website and send a link to that. I did send the resource guide, but I'll, I'll send that again in email and please let us know if you have um, additional questions that come up, um, you know, or, or you need anything from us, we're here to help you. And we look forward again to seeing you all successfully pass the exam. Enjoy your weekend. Good luck, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Good luck.